Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us at Prince Center New York for tonight's conversation with Julia Kern, Aaron Coleman, and Lois Serrata, moderated by Carmen Ermo, Associate Curator at the Brooklyn Museum Center for Feminist Art. I'm Robin Siddle, Exhibitions and Programs Coordinator at Prince Center New York. Each of these artists you'll hear from tonight have worked currently on view in our summer exhibition, New Voices on Transformation. This is the inaugural presentation of our re-envisioned open call program, providing a curator selected cohort of artists with a platform for their work and support at a pivotal moment in their careers. For the pilot year of New Voices, we encouraged applicants to consider their work in terms of transformation. This could reference, for example, a perspective or expectation, a social or political reality, or a traditional process or medium, encouraging an open-ended reading. New Voices on Transformation is currently on view at our Chelsea exhibition space, and our summer hours are Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. A quick note about accessibility for tonight's program. We have live captioning available in English. You can enable captions by clicking the caption button at the bottom of your screen on desktop or by going into the settings menu on mobile. And tonight's program is also being recorded and will be available on our YouTube account in about a week or so. Now I'll invite our artists to please join me on screen. Welcome Aaron, Julia, Lois, and Carmen. And please just say a quick hello so that we know your voices. Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. This is Lois. Hi. <laughs> Great job taking turns, everyone. Um, we're happy to have you all with us and think about your work tonight through a guided conversation. Uh, for folks watching from home, we invite you to send us questions using the Q&A function. We'll take them throughout the night and also reserve some time at the end dedicated to that. Uh, the public chat will also be open. Feel free to contribute to the conversation there by sharing comments or other thoughts that aren't direct questions. And finally, as a heads up, there will be a super quick survey at the end of the event tonight. We appreciate you sharing your feedback to help us produce better programs. Uh, and now I'll hand things over to Carmen. Thank you, Robin. And thanks everybody for joining us on a hot summer's night, even if it's not so hot where you are. Um, I do wanna tip my hat to the wonderful Robin who's been an incredible curatorial collaborator on this project through the whole way through. Um, so bravo to Robin, a special thanks to Jen and Judy at Prince Center New York. The whole team there has been incredible to work with. And as some folks might know, I was invited from the outside world, some might even say from the non-print world as a feminist curator to, um, to kind of explore and set a theme for a newly revamped um, um, iteration of the New Voices program, which is a long running, much beloved, currently accepting applications um, program with Print Center. And um, it was a very humbling, inspiring experience um, almost 500 people applied to be in this cohort. And uh, the final group of eight is fantastic. The exhibition is on view until August 25th. So definitely get to Chelsea if you can physically be there. If not, there are fabulous images on the website. We're gonna be seeing some of them today. Um, there's also a beautiful small publication, New Voices on Transformation, gorgeously illustrated with bios as well as an essay kind of traversing all eight artists. So of course I wanna thank the three I have here today, Aaron, Julia, and Lois. And I also want to shout out the work of Juana Estrada Hernandez, Nina Jordan, Farah Muhammad, Jacqueline Stryker, and Erica Sogo, who are also in this cohort and on view and had a panel that you can now check out online. Um, so I'm just going to do the quickest of micro introductions before getting into a conversation. I think what excites me so much about the full cohort, um, especially when you're looking at ultimately so many images digitally is how the space really sings with your work together. And I, I find that this group of three is a really sharp, um, cohesive, overlapping, yet differentiated um, and super amazing group of artists who maybe, you know, um, are gonna blow our minds with their printmaking prowess um, and hopefully skills in describing it virtually. Cause I think it's always a challenge when you're talking about work that has such a tactile uh, presence to do it online. So. We're gonna be doing this mostly alphabetically. Um, so I wanna shout out Aaron Coleman. He's a multidisciplinary artist and the Kenneth E. Tyler Endowed Chair at the Heron School of Art and Design in Indianapolis. And his work is in numerous paper and print specific public collections. Um, we're also going to be speaking to Julia Curran, a printmaker who currently works and lives in Los Angeles. Um, you may have seen her work recently at Spring Break or in residence at Wasaic Project. And she's also a Fulbright scholar. Um, I also welcome 
gentleman, thank Lois Arada, uh, an artist who works, of course, in prints and specifically with an interest in letterpress, which I hope we'll get into. She's based in Providence, Rhode Island, where she'll soon be teaching at RISD, and she has held residences at Anderson Ranch and Inter Interface. Um, so yeah, like I said, I had an amazing time sifting through so many applications, and then ultimately, of course, yes, thanks everybody for shouting out in the chat. Feel free to use the chat. Um, around. Let us know where you're tuning in from. We'll definitely have moments to um, to talk and to hear your questions towards the end as well. So keep those going. And um, when we uh, when I was developing this theme, of course, I wanted to keep it very open. Um, having juried several open calls before at different institutions, I thought it was incredible to get so specific around printmaking and this opportunity of a honed and artist specific renovation of the new voices program right so it's it's the exhibition it's the publication it's these public programs but also the cohort was able to physically come to new york together to be there in a space together in celebration of the opening and celebration of each other and to see each other's work which i think is actually kind of rare when it comes to kind of a um you know a group cohort like this where artists are selected from disparate locations and maybe they each kind of get to spotlight and, and show up at a certain moment if that at all um but i you know again shouting out print center new york we're building into this program the travel, the connection, the continuity that, um, from what I'm absorbing, is definitely a part of the printmaking world, certainly the art world itself, but but, um, but loving to see the, the connections that have been made. So I did set a very general theme, right? I was thinking about this idea of transformation, not just the transformation of the New Voices program itself, the transformation of the Print Center moving to an incredible ground floor, super visible, super gorgeous new gallery in Chelsea, um, but then also the transformation that we're all going through, right? Three years out from COVID, from the kind of disruptions of that pandemic and what that pandemic threw into relief, the truth, the honesty, the realities that have always been part of our culture, but then all of a sudden felt very kind of shaken out or at least spoken about in places in the media or in institutions like museums where they previously had only been whispered. I think it was a moment of thinking about, you know, how that kind of manifests not just in artwork, but also in processes. So again, as somebody who, you know, has a love for prints, has worked with prints through in various moments throughout my career, um, I was really also interested in how these artists and especially the final cohort of eight, but this idea of how transformation is um, present specifically in the process of printmaking itself. And so I would like to just open it up with a general introductory question for the three of you. If you could please introduce your work through the lens of this idea of transformation. And if you could maybe speak to specifically the works that um, Robin will be sharing in the PowerPoint, which are the works on view currently. And what was the evolution in your work um, that led to the particular works we're seeing in New Voices? So I'm not sure if alphabetical is a way we'll always do it, but Aaron, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. And conveniently, my image is first, so that works out. Um, yeah, I I have a, an extensive background in traditional print. Um, my work has always been social, political in nature, um, but for the longest time, it was uh, traditional lithography, mezzotint, intaglio, screen print. Um, and around, I think, 2017, um, a lot of things happened. Colin Kaepernick took a knee on the field. Uh, my father got a genealogy study done and found out that 73% of his bloodline comes from Ghana and the Congo. Um, the world is kind of erupting, you know, in, in social unrest. And so uh, it was difficult for me to get out what I was thinking about or what I was feeling just through traditional print on paper. And so my studio practice went through a drastic transformation uh, into the sculptural realm, both in a sort of 2D assemblage on the wall and then uh, 3D in the round sculpture. Um, but with that came a need to also uh, transform the way that I use printmaking, right? It wasn't just changing my studio practice, it was me trying to figure out how to continue using printmaking uh, in a sculptural sense. And so I started to use screen print primarily to control sort of inherently charged materials like um, iron loaded paint that would turn to rust on paper uh, it, when it was printed. Or what you're seeing here, uh, this black material is AstroTurf rubber crumb and I'm screen printing adhesive uh, in order to control that sort of uncontrollable material. And so the materials that I'm using have 
this sort of conceptual weight for me. And I'm now using printmaking to sort of orchestrate those materials rather than creating drawn images on stones or copper plates or things like that. Um, as far as conceptually, uh, when I think about transformation, I wasn't necessarily thinking about transformation when I was working on these pieces, but I was thinking about um, being in two places at once. I was thinking about sort of the simultaneous nature of joy and pain in the life of a person of color. I was thinking about uh, the fact that I was living in a very conservative state in the desert um, and that I didn't come from that place. And so I started to make these landscapes that uh, now when I look back are sort of transforming the place where I was to the place where maybe I wanted to be. Um, yeah, so I don't know how much time I have to talk about this, but I don't want to talk too much out of the gate. Yeah, we'll oh. come right back around to it. Maybe that's a, a good place to end and pass it over to Julia and we can return to In the Wake. Yeah, so when I saw the open call for the theme of On Transformation for uh, the New Voices program and I saw that Carmen was the curator, I was like, oh, this, I'm going to give this a shot. I think it could work because my work is really about transformation, both on personal and community and social and political, you know, global scales. Um, and I'm really thinking about, you know, um, Carmen wrote a beautiful essay in the um, catalog for this exhibition. And in the essay, she talks about just like the precarity we're all experiencing on a global scale right now with environmental degradation and then everything that the pandemic threw into relief. And um, similar to what Erin was saying is my work in the past had always been more socio-political commentary and really like firmly rooted in that history of print. And uh, specifically, I used to make satire, political satire on toxic masculinity. And then during the pandemic, I made this sort of shift both on a conceptual level and on a materials level. So materially, I lost my access to my community print shop and had nowhere to make screen prints and woodcuts anymore and started making more mixed media collage and actually using prints, like transforming the material of a print into um, material for a painting. So cutting back into prints, um, making them into paintings, uh, taking an image that is a print, turning it into a painting, taking a painting, making a print out of it, kind of going back and forth like that. And then also conceptually, just thinking of, you know, if we're going to move forward through the future, this requires um, a deep level of social transformation from the individual, like a focus on the individual to the collective and interconnection. And then that, of course, requires personal transformation, community transformation, societal con transformation, et cetera. And so in my work, metaphorically, and I'll kind of pause here and we can go back to that, I'm using metaphors for transformation, such as um, digestion and soil and decomposition and thinking of these cycles of transformation that are found in nature and how we can look to that for lessons for what we need to do now in this moment. Thank you. Uh, love it. Oh, this is a tough act to follow. Hi, everyone. I'm Lois from earlier when you asked me what I sounded like. Uh, so I am an artist based in Providence, Rhode Island. I'm originally from Salt Lake City. And a lot of uh, the work that I make is about my family's history with Japanese American incarceration. So my paternal grandmother uh, was forcibly removed from her home near San Diego and spent um, her high school years in a campsite in Post in Arizona. So the prints that are on view at the Print Center are all uh, sort of riffs on the idea of WPA travel posters. So thinking about big, bright imagery, uh, you know, and, and destinations that maybe seemed more welcoming. Uh, but in my case, I've sort of subverted the, the subject of those prints, and they're all different Japanese-American incarceration sites. So with a lot of my work, uh, I try to make work that is really bright and poppy and hopefully get people interested and uh, welcome them in before they sort of get that darker uh, subcontext of the work and, and a little bit of history as well. Uh, you know, the history of incarceration is, at, at least it seems to me, more taught in the West. So I'm finding making 
making this work on the East Coast, that there's a moment of making sure that everybody knows where I'm coming from in a way that doesn't feel totally alienating. But hopefully we can have a conversation about what this history means and, and what it means also in the context of everything that's happening in our, our current government and how we're treating immigrants. All of the same things are, are sort of happening again. Um, I am also really interested in a lot of research and a lot of, uh, you know, the concept of what an archive is, you know, who is gathering images, who is uh, sharing the information, and how can I sort of transform or spin uh, that history that maybe might be missing in some of the, the cracks between sort of the official uh, story or the official narrative. Uh, with these prints, um, kind of following that WPA arc, they're all hand cut stencils that I've then uh, screen printed. So again, trying to think of big, bright colors. Um, and yeah, I, I'll pause there. I'm gonna ramble forever. Oh, I forgot. I also made this penny machine to transform your pocket change into tiny prints, which is so fun and so recognizable and also a little bleak because they are also Japanese American incarceration sites, but you get to pick and you get to put in the labor to really monetize that dark history. Wow, yes, amazing, all three of you. Uh, the penny press, indelible moment when you're in the show. It's, I think there's something so brilliant and yeah, just so now, right? This idea of like, people are having a communal moment, they're laughing, they're building something, they're maybe feeling the energy of like a creating a print through a press and realizing, oh, okay, I'm looking around, I'm in the space, like maybe this is part of the process, but then like you're saying, ultimately it's a, you know, unfortunately deadly serious topic that like you're saying on the East Coast, you know, can be shared more. So I love that idea too of, you know, when we were doing our studio visit, I'm like, I love, I have my press pennies from all my childhood museums and whatever, and the natural history of this and that. And it really made me think too, how all those sites are just as loaded, right? And that like these, all these cultural icons and um, stories, monuments, spaces, landscapes that are marketed um, by the state as, um, yeah, as, <laughs> as um, monuments or as, uh, you know, sites to visit, right, that there's, there are these incredible political dimensions to that. And so I feel like somehow taking us back to this like souvenir moment, this memory um, of being out and about seeing something new and bringing it home with you, I feel like it's a really powerful gesture. You know, not everybody is going to pick up our beautiful little publication, but maybe someday somebody's going through their wallet and finds this and remembers, oh, shit. Yeah, that was actually a pretty um, serious endeavor. And um, yeah, I love the span that you all kind of dug into on your work. And maybe Lois, I'll, I'll spend more time with your work thinking about the word that you used also subvert and then also spin. Because I remember in our studio visit, you were talking about the research you did into the Library of Congress um, and the photographs that essentially were, you know, the US government spin on these internment sites, right? Documenting it for their own purposes, but doing so in a way that I remember you described as kind of rosy um, and that it was something that was being, you know, obviously engineered into this imagery of propaganda. And I think in your work, obviously that impression that one gets um, with the exception in the gallery of the work where you see the laborers, the people actually doing that labor on the land, they are these kind of stark images of, you know, this myth, right? This myth of like empty West, um, you know, the, the depopulated and stunning um, surroundings. So I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, finding that source, what led you to those images at the Library of Congress, and then how, you know, what, what is the kind of adaptation that you're doing um, to subvert, to spin, to spin the spin? Sure. So, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of those images are paid for by the government. And so I think in a lot of my work, I try to use government printed materials as a source of inspiration, or also then reusing the images that have already been paid for by the government, but sort of as my uh, research baseline. So I think um, a lot of folks will probably know Ansel Adams, Dorothea Lang, all of those kind of names of photographers around that era were hired by the Works Progress Administration uh, package, the WPA, to take photographs. And so in the situations of the internment sites, uh, you know, they're taking photographs of people gardening, people playing baseball. There are never really photos of the guard towers. I think Ansel Adams maybe has one. And it, again, it's supposed to be described as camp. Camp is something fun, you know, like we go to summer camp. And it kind of strips out a lot of the uh, kind of really gritty day-to-day -day experiences. Uh, for me, in using the images from the Library of Congress, um, partly it was driven by the pandemic. So I would love to be able to visit these sites more in person. I'd love to be able to go to 
uh, to visit the Library of Congress in person, but because of the pandemic, I shifted all of my research purposes to being online and learning that the Library of Congress is free and has a lot of really high resolution images. So for me, it was a good starting place. Um, and I don't know if anyone else researches like this, where you're like, okay, here's this mystery folder on my desktop. How many images can I jam into it? And so I'm slowly trying to get better at citations and remembering where things came from. But in this situation where I was only using the Library of Congress, it was a little easier. Aaron, I see you laughing. I know it's you. Um, it's a little easier to say, oh yeah, I use this one source. Um, and I think too, you know, in thinking about uh, sort of the dark tourism element, you know, when you visit, for instance, Manzanar, which is a site that's been really rebuilt, there's a barracks you can walk into, you can walk into a kitchen, they have a big museum, they also have a gift shop where you can buy a lot of, um, you know, coffee cups with the type of imagery that I use to make my work, which is always kind of a little jarring. The one place in that site that you can't go is up the guard tower. So I think it is sort of about, you know, shifting that perspective and sort of you know, kind of trying to level the playing field of what's actually shown. I've blacked out. Did I answer your question? Absolutely. Amazingly done. <laughs> yeah. And I also was digging what you were saying. Great work um, in terms of like you kept emphasizing the idea that this, you know, the government already paid for this. Right. So, you know, we're the government citizens. We're funding this government. We're funding, as you were saying, to the things that are happening right now um, that are not that different, um, you know, done under totally, you know, reportedly democratic, et cetera. So, it's kind of an interesting thing too. I love that about not just the penny press, like the joy, the intensity of creating that, but the fact that you're like removing, yes, it is a penny, but you're removing legal tender from circulation. You're kind of creating a pause in that object from being useful in the capitalistic sense and turning it into an artwork, which we know is useful, maybe in an anti-capitalistic sense, but certainly in other ways. And yeah, but I'm interested, there is definitely an overlap in terms of, um, Kind of cannibalizing these existing images whether they are you know powerful historical traditional to use Aaron's word you know I'm thinking about in your work Aaron some of those excerpts um, uh, from your gateways that come from the Gustave Doré Grand Bible of Tours from 1866 and of course you know the literal loan shark sign uh, that also is lifted you know literally from the ground so I'm wondering if you could speak about this kind of idea of finding these sources and then reimagining them within these works. Yeah, I mean, I, Lois and I have a lot in common uh, in this regard. I think for me, the imagery that I've made throughout my career has always been about retelling a story or recontextualizing something that people think they understand. And so whether that's comic book images or religious iconography or propaganda, I've always taken things that already exist and twist them to tell what I consider to be the truth, right? Now that's always relative, but um, we know that a certain side of history has always been kept from us. Um, and so speaking about history, um, I was listening to a conversation between Fred Moten and Sadia Hartman called The Black Outdoors. And Fred Moten in that discussion says, um, escape is not an achievement, it's an activity. And what he's referring to is the fact that whatever you're trying to escape from is always there, right? You never actually get escaped, right? It's always on you. And so when I heard that, I started thinking about the sort of ripple effects of the transatlantic slave trade. And, you know, it went from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration to voter suppression to uh you know economic inequality and there's always been some version of that you know project at work and so as i've been sort of looking for objects or finding objects my interest is now in tying that thread from then to now taking what happened you know historically and showing how it's still happening today or the different version of what it is today. And so um, to be specific, Robin, if you can pull up the um, In the Wake piece, um, I was on my way to my studio one day and I drove past a payday loans and checks cashed business. And uh, the sign for that business, which is about 20 feet up in the air had shattered and the pieces of it were all in the street. Um, now, immediately I thought I need to go pick that up. And foolishly, I did not. I, I just kept going to my studio. Um, 
And I came back the next day or uh, two days later to, to pick up the pieces and it was all gone, uh, except for this one piece, which was tucked away in the bushes. And so I climbed into the bushes and pulled this out. Um, and I'm not sure if I had found or acquired all of the pieces that this would have came to be. Um, this piece sat in my studio for a, a month or so before I sort of recognized the shape of the shark fin. And uh, what I realized is, depending on what neighborhood you're in, these payday loans and check cast businesses will have different color signage. And so in a lot of neighborhoods here in Indianapolis, they're red, white, and blue. But in this particular neighborhood where I found this, it's a historically black neighborhood. Uh, there's a big Jamaican population. There's a big Hispanic population. Um, uh, there's an Ethiopian population. And so this particular predatory business had used the color palette of the Jamaican restaurant and the African hair uh, supply store on either side of it to sort of blend into the neighborhood and to sort of, you know, uh, pull in people from the neighborhood to, to prey on their economic sort of unfortunate circumstances. Um, and so it's sort of, this piece sort of made itself, but this is where my head is at the moment is, is finding objects and materials that are automatically imbued with uh, the history that we know or, or that I want to bring to the surface. Um, and so this sort of, these businesses only exist in places where people are suffering economically because they know people need quick money. And so they'll give you a loan against your paycheck. And then when you get your paycheck, you either pay them or you owe them more money. Uh, and that's just the next sort of iteration of, um, you know, people of color, particularly black people uh, being at a disadvantage in their own sort of neighborhood, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this piece is so stunning in person. Um, I remember our studio visit, you were sort of saying like, you're figuring it out, the printing on the on the um, sort of verso had begun, um, but you know, to see it actually come together in the space and also those kind of visual illusions between this like textured rubber crumb playground type surface um, that's meant to sort of like, yeah, like, uh, you know, be a little bit kinder on your kids' knees and like provide a softer spot for people to land and seeing you kind of reinterpret that um, as this kind of like churning water. Um, I think it's, you know, so many of us who work in these spaces, you know, it's such a privilege to be able to curate exhibitions, talk about ideas, bring forward artists. And, you know, we also recognize too, like, right, the ma machinations of the art world and like, what are the so-called trends that are actually, you know, long-term interests, decades long experience, buildings on communities that, museums are suddenly getting to. So for me, there was also something really um, powerful too about that form taking shape in a gallery, right? Like specifically cutting through um, these hallowed white walls and some of these structures that um, are part of those myths that I think, you know, all three of your work, you know, really breaks down. And I like what you were saying too about um, kind of the then and the now and how things reinvent themselves, but they kind of find themselves in that legacy um, or are, are, are designed as such, obviously, you know, thinking about, you know, like the legislation that surrounds us these days where you see this kind of like white supremacist edifice, you know, refusing CRT, critical race theory, when they themselves, whether it's, you know, the everyday businesses that are, you know, taking redlining forward and like you said, literally taking money from black communities or, you know, universities, right, scared to, uh, to be controversial, scared to take a stand, scared to stand up for their staff, um, and and therefore kind of allowing for these um, same patterns to move forward. But it's it's literally surrounding us, like it's all happening. And the folks who are, you know, railing against critical race theory, or railing against you know feminism, or railing against reproductive liberation, or you know truth telling in, in the style, also like you're saying, Lois too, with these sites recognizing recognizing them as sites of incarceration and a continued history, you know that's all happening. They're pulling those same levers, but just using different language. So I feel like your, these visual languages are so powerful in terms of something that's always interested me, right? These ideas of like a history that is silenced, a history that is invisible, 
but that is being made visible through visual art, right? So these are objects that are going to continue long past um, new voices. They are going to have lives in different exhibitions and different publications. People are gonna take a picture of this on their phone and find it in a tough moment later on. And I just love that kind of sense of circulation. And in terms of Julia's work, you know, this idea of this idea again of then and now was resonating for me in your work, Julia, thinking about how a lot of your um, altar like triptychs and these sort of forms of um, bodily exchanges and the ways that we like just live and sustain as as bodies as people um, come from some of your interest in these 14th century wood block wood block anatomical prints and um, thinking about these scientific um, divisions of the body, these kind of authorities of medicine passed down through the centuries and how your work um, you know, kind of pushes up against that through your own experience, through your own bodily reality. But then also I feel like letting us have some of that juicy feeling and like knowingness that like I feel is very much at work with a lot of the squirting and squeezing that I feel like your um, your figures are doing, whether the figure is a plant or a person or a, a mother earth. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if you could speak to that that use of, or at least that jumping off point of these like anatomical prints and, and your transformation of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had the pleasure of going to the medical library at University of Wisconsin-Madison when I was a visiting artist there, like, I think it was like maybe a week before a pandemic lockdown happened. Um, so that was kind of wild, but had a really great visit there. And the curator um, is incredible. And I spent hours with her pouring over these um, old anatomical books from like the 1500s and 1700s. And there was one by, uh, I think it's Vesalius who made it. And it's this book and it's all woodcuts. And the way that like he was depicting the body was that it was almost like a pop-up book. Like imagine like a pop-up book for kids. It had these foldable flaps that you could pull back. So you could open the chest cavity to see the lungs and then you could pull back the lungs and see the heart and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I just found that fascinating. And of course, that's like a whole other talk, but these books, the way they were created, like, or have like a really dark history to them, because of course, like whose bodies were being exhumed, you know, for the practice of um, discovering what, you know, what the human body holds inside. Um, I got a little off track on what, what the original question was, but uh, I guess that basically I got really excited about um, just that like objectness of, um, of these books and started thinking in my own work, like, again, tying it back to this theme of transformation, like, what, um, you know, what inner landscapes, you know, can look like. So I'm kind of using, you know, the same device of these, you know, these flaps that open and close um, to reveal, you know, like something that's like sort of hidden or concealed underneath. And, you know, tying this back into my own bodily experience, you know, a big part of my work is, you know, is, is thinking about like, how do we embrace, you know, our fleshy and abject nature, you know, we're here in these, you know, these temporal bodies and these ephemeral bodies. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we, I guess, historically, we have this idea that, um, that like somehow our mind and spirit is separate from our bodies and that our bodies are something to be ashamed of, you know, that's definitely present in like, Christian and Western thought. Um, and, you know, we live in this society that's really beheaded. Um, and so I'm definitely thinking about a lot of that just from my own experiences with an autoimmune disease and like really finding healing through getting back into my body and not considering my body is like this machine composed of separate parts that somehow don't inform each other. Um, so yeah, so that's where I started thinking about digestion really as a metaphor for uh, transformation. And that's also what really interested me about these, these uh, 15th century woodcut anatomical books. Yeah, and I love too how like, at least in my vision, and I didn't see those books, but in my vision of these kind of more scientific approaches to the body, there's so much like siloing, right? It's like a singular image with scientific facts and names and Latin and what, what not surrounding it. Um, and there's a sense of kind of like all over richness and riotousness and again, like juiciness happening in your work where um, maybe Robin, we could go back to one of the altars. Um, I call them altars <laughs> because I, yeah. also, I have lots of Catholic baggage around the body, et cetera. So these always have resonated with me. And, um, and yeah, thinking about how this, even in this image where you have sort of like the life growing out of a skull and then to the right and left, you have this almost like a 
scientific, you know, macro zoomed in microscopic view of, you know, what, what this growth looks like, but, you know, there's also, I think a sense of humor and context, right? It's not, it's not positioned on the page and this kind of stark relief, but it's in, it's in space. It's in the body is placed in the world, right? As we exist, right? We're, we're prone to the realities of the world around us. I mean, I know so many of us have gone through things, um, that you know make us wonder exactly that you know what are what are these um i guess boundaries of of experience that that art that connection that just human existence can kind of push us through and i love to this sense of, of the i don't know if i if you would agree with this but i always found the expression of this kind of mother earth figure to be almost like scheming like she's a little bit like you know, we're, we're part of her plan. Um, she's, uh, she's sort of laughing at us in our way of, you know, burying our dead and putting a tombstone on and she's, she's waiting there underneath to kind of subsume us and control us and bring us into this system of, of decay. And I, of course, love the detail in this particularly amazingly titled Memento Mori for evil men. One day you two will die, she will eat you, then shit out your bones. I love a great title like that. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. I have a good time in my studio. And um, yeah, you know, I really like, I, you pointed out that like, like some tension in the work, like I definitely am playing with, you know, tensions between honestly, like rage, you know, like there's rage and tenderness in these and there's grotesque and abjectness and humor. Um, and also maybe like wildness and some tenderness and maybe shame and vulnerability. Like just again, thinking of how we, we learn to, to, to see and understand and feel about our, our own, our own existence and like, you know, what, what we live in. Um, and so the, I started using the altarpiece as sort of a device, you know, again, like thinking of Catholic baggage, I, you know, also went to Catholic school for a couple of years and, um, which, you know, definitely informs my work. And um, I love the altarpiece as a device of like venerating something. And what I'm thinking about is how to maybe sort of like replace these more rigid and hierarchical and maybe like binary stories we've been taught with something that's a little bit more maybe close to reality and, um, and less based in shame. And so, um, yeah, so that's that piece. And then also you mentioned like these, you know, this, this mother nature personification um, as being like a little mischievous. Um, I definitely am thinking about how we personify nature as a mother and how that sort of allows us to, you know, we give ourselves the permission to just like take and take and take and drain resources dry and, um, and, and destroy and dominate. And we're, you know, we're actually part of nature too. And so we're doing that to ourselves on, you know, on lots of different material, physical, emotional, and psychic levels. Um, and so here, the stories that I'm sort of replacing in these altar pieces are sort of, you know, holding up are maybe these, these mother nature figures that are less benign, less nurturing, um, but maybe a little more mischievous, a little more consuming, a little more, a little more hungry. Um, yeah. And just perpetuating these cycles of life, death and life again, life again. Amazing. Yeah. And I'm even thinking here and, and realizing that, um, in all three of your works in the show, of course, you know, your practices far exceed um, what's on view at uh, PCNY, but that there are all these horizon lines, right? And there's kind of like a, a foreground, background, a landscape that's being bisected, being literally um, yet yeah, drawn out in the image itself. So I feel like that's on the one hand kind of situating the viewer too, right? In a, in a kind of space of distance and a space of welcome in some cases, like you use the word veneration, Julia, um, but certainly Lois, like thinking about, you know, these posters that our eyes are accustomed to seeing this kind of, um, you know, propagandistic um, approach to the West. And, and then Aaron, your work kind of that tumultuous sort of like, a, I, I love how your, um, your gateways have this sense of, you know, I remember you telling me this, like, yeah, you mentioned it was super dry, this desert that you were working in. And like, there's just like rain, right? There's like an intense rain, a wall of rain. And you're looking through the rain to get to that distance with these kind of layers of, of the ground before you. So I'm curious, you know, when you're in the studio, if you, and I, you know, we only have a few minutes left before we open it up to questions. We're welcoming questions for all artists, for individual artists, you know, please um, join in the conversation. But until then, if you'd like to maybe talk specifically about either the process a little, in a little bit more depth, I know all of you have touched on 
kind of the way that printmaking is transformed in your in your projects, but then also thinking about how you think about the viewer, right, or the eventual audience of these pieces when you're in the studio. I mean, Erin, you're literally in a studio right now. You have it behind you. Maybe you could kick it off. Um, but you know, where where is that kind of place of um, that moment of invitation where you're you're having that exchange with with the audience? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely thinking about the viewer because my work is about my experience and my experience has always been sort of at the hands of other people, right? Um, and my work in that series specifically is about access and comfort. Um, and so uh, they're called gateways and, and someone might assume when you hear the word gateway that you can pass through it but some of those gateways are completely bricked up, right? You, you can't even see past the brick wall uh, to get through the gate or the gate is met with a brick wall. Um, there's meant to be a sort of enticing beauty to the landscape uh, and to the colors and to the sort of lush trees and rain. But at the same time, uh, there's graffiti and a brick wall and these sort of dark fences and I think what I'm what I'm curious about is what makes people feel comfortable or safe or protected. And for me, you know, this like idea of a white picket fence neighborhood, it, it's always been a place where I felt highly exposed, right? Because people who look like me historically haven't been the majority population in neighborhoods like that. Um, and so I feel much more comfortable when I see chain link fences and brick walls covered in graffiti, because I, at least I know there's somebody in that neighborhood who thinks like I do, or who has the same tendencies to sort of destroy public property as I do. Uh, <laughs> but, but in general, I'm thinking about um, ideas of access and, and where you might want to find yourself or, or where you would be comfortable passing through. And so, for example, in this one, uh, a street light becomes like a light from the heavens. And those two things are sort of at maybe visual odds with each other, but they function exactly the same. You know, you might uh, in downtown Indianapolis growing up, we would find ourselves like on the corner outside of a bar under a street light freestyling in a cipher, you know, and that was like heaven to us. Um, but somebody driving by from a different neighborhood might not want to be on that street corner, you know? So, I'm thinking about the viewer almost as though like we're both standing there trying to decide which one of us is going to go through this gateway and which one is is more comfortable or less comfortable going through it. I'll pass it off. I'll pick on Lois. Yeah, go ahead. Lois. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, Aaron, you didn't popcorn me, Professor. Uh, hi, uh, I think about the viewer, but I try not to get too in my head about it because I think a lot of the subject matter that I'm trying to convey um, can be pretty alienating. So I think in a lot of my work, I try to leave a lot of physical space, which to me is sort of the, the entry point. These prints are a little bit of a departure for me because they're so big and such big solid fills of color. Um, as Carmen mentioned, I'm primarily a letterpress printer. So a lot of my work is just text, usually on kind of a bigger white field. So, you know, for me in leaving that physical space, but also sort of leaving some kind of contextual, like what is actually happening here? Like, I like this, but why do I like this? What is sort of the, the meaning? I think that's often how I think about engaging the viewer. And with the penny press in particular, I, I really like taking, you know, commonly seen things. So I hired a banner towing plane a few years back uh, to kind of carry a subversive message over some beaches. Um, and so the penny press is sort of an extension of that, taking a really recognizable form that people are drawn to without quite knowing sort of what the, the context is, is behind it. Julia, I'm yeah. going to you. Thanks for the popcorn. Yeah, um, I think the first half of this question was a about materials a little bit more. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I kind of talked about that uh, earlier, just kind of like transforming print into, you know, into painting material. Um, 
you know, and kind of like going back to my angsty teenage years where I would just hide in my bedroom and make, you know, make collages. Like I love collages. It's really like a great way for me to kind of think. And so putting together these, you know, mixed media pieces with paper and collage is really fun. Um, and kind of like really weaving back and forth between painting and print. Um, thinking about the viewer, I have to say, I try not to get in my head too much about the viewer too, kind of like what you were saying, Lois. Um, but I'm also trying to think about the viewer more. Um, I'm at this, you know, I'm at this point in my studio where, you know, last year or this year, I guess, was like a really big year of showing and showing and showing and showing and showing and showing and like a lot of external, you know, energy. And so I'm really excited to kind of be in my studio and kind of come home to myself a bit and and get get like more grounded and think about like what what I'm doing next. And so in the work that I'm in the very early stages planning for, you know, I'm thinking of the tension in my work between, you know, sort of like what we're talking about, like some rage and, and some tenderness and some uh, grotesqueness and humor. And I found that in my, in my work with viewers that either draws people in where they're like, they come in and they're like, let me tell you about my whole life. Like this, like resonates with me so much, you know, there's, there's been tears, there's been hugs, like these really beautiful, like deep emotional conversations, um, showing my work, which I love. Um, that's, I'm here for that. Um, and then other times I've had people come up and they see my, you know, my smiling face and then they look at my work and they're like, <laughs> wow okay and walk away <laughs> which is great because it's not for everybody um but I'm also thinking you know with that like how can I play with that tension maybe in in different ways and in more nuanced ways and how can I be kinder you know my work is so personal it's like such to me it feels like this like my lifelong you know part of my lifelong spiritual journey right is in my studio practice um and so when I'm thinking about, you know, as I go through my life and as I, as I grow and, and, and get more mature, like, how can I be kinder to myself? How can I be kinder in my work? And maybe how can I be kinder to viewers? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I'm, that's something I'm thinking about right now. And I'm not really sure that's where that's going to go. Um, yeah. And how I can still hang on to that tension. But uh, yeah, maybe think about it in different ways. Well, I love like how your answer and your inspirations range from kindness and rage. I feel like rage <laughs> is totally an amazing resource in creating ideas and images and potential. And also like grief. Like I feel like we're in such a period, like, you know, like we live in a country that doesn't know how to grieve. Like we don't have practices around grief and we're coming off of a period of time that is, that has affected all of us so much. And it's like, you know, okay, capitalism, like, let's get back to work and be productive. Like, and we can't do that. Like, that is not, um, that's not working for any of us. And so I'm thinking about like, like, along with rage, like grief, like maybe like the grief that's behind the rage and how to like, I don't know, could talk about that all day, but like how to make more space for that too, like that tension between grief and, and, um, and joy and rage and tenderness. Oh, so powerful. I mean, all your work is, spans all these you know, yeah, things that we see as binaries, or at least we're instructed and informed to experiencing them as a part, but really come together. Yeah, fluidly, messily, all of those things in your practices. There is a great question in the Q&A for Aaron to talk a little bit about how you work between the print and sculptural modes in your work. Like you kind of used even the word traditional at the kind of start of uh, our little chat here. Is there a tension for you between moving between 2D and 3D and where are you most comfortable? No, there's no tension. <laughs> uh, I'm a, like a severe workaholic and a maniac in my studio, and I can't stop making things ever. And, and it's like medicine to me. Um, the problem with that is I get like bored really easily, you know, because if you do the same thing over and over, it, it gets to you. Um, but uh, my serious answer for this question is I do whatever needs to be done to make the work. And when you start working with found objects or non-traditional materials because of their sort of daily, you know, use or, or what they're supposed to be used for and trying to challenge that, um, 2D work falls away a little bit and traditional processes in print fall away a little bit and you have to figure out new ways to, to make the work. So, um, 
you know, for a long time, I was in the, the practice of finding problematic objects on the market, either on eBay or, or like thrift stores, things like that. And, and talking to the owners about why they should give them to me for free um, so that I could take them off of the market so they wouldn't end up in some like racist dude's man caves in the middle of the woods somewhere, you know? Um, and so when you have an object, you know, uh, that has a problematic history, it's dimensional and you can't print on it per se. I mean, there's ways to think about it, but um, I do what I need to do to alter that object or to recontextualize it. Sometimes that means I have to learn how to weld. Sometimes that means I have to learn how to cast my body in alginate and make, you know, plaster body parts. It, it's, I like learning. I like making stuff. I like working with my hands and I like giving the work, the energy and the time and the consideration that it deserves. Um, and so, no, I don't, there's no tension for me. I don't feel like a printmaker. I definitely don't feel like a sculptor, maybe a sculptor with like a lowercase s. Um, I think if I had to like nail myself down, I would say I feel most like a tailor. Like I find things and I make alterations uh, and I never know what those alterations are gonna be. Beautiful, great answer. There's a, there's a great question from Olivia. I wanna thank everybody for engaging. We got some great questions lined up. Keep them coming, Olivia is asking, Aaron, I feel like you were muddying these waters with Lois, Julia. Is there a threshold for what makes it a print? When does a piece stop being a print? Or is that not as important of a distinction now? <laughs> just feel defining questions if you really could. And just yeah, <laughs> I, um, I think, I don't know. I don't really think about that too much. Um, I think for me, you know, the penny press still falls into what I think of as a print because people are making a multiple of something. I've just changed how that thing is made and the person is making it versus me. But also I think when I think about what is a print, I often think about it from my background at the letterpress print shop that I work where it's commercial printing and I've been there for 14 years now. So I'm used to being able to quickly go in and make a multiple of 200. Whereas, you know, in a shop like the one that's behind Aaron, I might spend one day making three prints. So for me, it sort of changed um, how I think about prints in a way and sort of wanting to stay more in that commercial realm, which feels more accessible just because I can make 300 posters that might be okay that I can just give away versus um, trying to bring them into a gallery setting or, or a more fine art setting. Yeah, Lois. Um... I remember our first studio visit. I have it here on my wall. Your beautiful letterpress. It says 2023 already. Take it easy, slow down, and rest. I know we all did so much of that this year, right? So <laughs> yeah. but I like to make New Year's cards that don't apply to myself. So there you go. exactly. Just put the energy out in the world and see if it gets returned. Thank you. Um, another great question here from JB, specifically for Lois, with a thanks for everybody. Um, are there more works from this series? Would you ever expand it to other types of political landscapes, or is it important it's specifically Japanese internment camps because of your family's history? Ooh, that's a great question. It's definitely something that I've thought about, and there, the subject matter is so big around that particular history, so I have a lot of ideas of other projects that I want to get involved in. Um, I have been asked by other folks to collaborate on other projects, and I think, you know, my approach to archives and to history does work for, you know, other stories that haven't been told as well. I think for me, because my personal connection is so strong with the Japanese American incarceration, it's easiest for me to make that work and then be able to say, this is my story so we can talk about it. And you have to look at me in the face when you're saying really mean things about it. And I'm a person and look at me. Yes. So I haven't quite figured out how to apply that to, to other stories yet. Interesting. I mean, even visually your work, I feel like in particular, the ones that are in the gallery, there's almost a sense too of like you're refocusing the lens or just like pulling out a little bit further from where the original photographer might have, you know, zeroed in without the guard tower and you're kind of taking a step back, showing the barracks. And I feel like there's just something very instructional about that too, right? Like look around, read between the lines, like make sure you're not just accepting what's being given to you, um, especially with, you know, the crazed world of like corporate consolidation of media that we're in. It's like, and things might be being said in different ways, but actually coming from the same source. Um, so a great question from Adrienne, um, which I love to spiral it out into the great community that um, you know, PCNY is fostering with this program. So 
Thank you, Adrian. What have you all taken from this opportunity platform and camaraderie of the New Voices Project and how do you see it affecting your work or you going forward? I'll jump in for that one. Um, yeah, so, and this is kind of like going back to that question about like, um, is there a threshold between like print and painting? Like when I think about, or print and painting, print and sculpture, print and, um, and yeah, and other mediums, um, I think something that's really special about printmaking is that it's inherently engenders community just because of the history of it. Like we're all gathering around presses, we're all gathering in shops together. Um, you can see behind Aaron, like the, the presses can be massive and he's in this beautiful shop right now. Um, and so historically it's this place where people come together and, um, and that part's really special. And I think that the Print Center New York with the New Voices program, um, to me, the best part of this was the incredibly fun, like five days that we all spent together in New York City, right? Like the show is beautiful and amazing, um, connecting with, you know, with Carmen, that's been really amazing, um, connecting with Print Center staff, um, but also like, like Lois and Aaron and I, like Aaron and I knew each other before, Lois, you know, you and I just met, we have like a group chat going on all the time like we were sending each other jokes right before you know jumping on here <laughs> you know and also like last week like I was like hey like this I had a weird thing happen at a gallery like could you help me with this you know and like we're like supporting each other um and so to me that's been such an important part of this program um that has been really beautiful I'll second that before Aaron jumps in and starts, you know, negatively talking about the group chat that I know he loves. Uh, but I think uh, Carmen, you and Robin and everyone at the Print Center put together such an amazing group of eight. And, you know, we were connected through different threads in our work, but also we were all sort of at different places in our experience as artists. And so it was great to be able to come together and say, oh, if you liked this residency, you might like this residency or maybe try this or, oh yeah, I'll see if I can find studio space, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, I think the connections that we've all made have been really rewarding. And of course, you know, the experience of being able to show at the Print Center, especially in that new location has been really, um, you know, kind of uh, amazing and still hard to believe. Um, but I left that week when we were all together, just feeling so inspired about, okay, well, Julia's combining media, Aaron's making big things. How can I take some of that inspiration back to my studio? Yeah, uh, Julia just like outed me. There's so many people know how grouchy I am and how much I hate group chats. <laughs> and so anybody who sees this that knows me is that, they're gonna be like, wait a minute, you're in a group chat and I'm in trouble now. Um, I mean, yeah, I echo what Lois and, and Julia just said. The, the, the program is amazing for um, networking and generating a sense of community, especially around a particular show. I mean, so often, at least in my experience, I'm sending my work out to shows. I can't always travel to those shows. Um, I have to sort of pick and choose. And so there may be a really amazing theme. There may be a really amazing group of artists in a show, and I never even get to see it. I see it online, I see the catalog. And so what's really special about this particular program is going to New York, being in the show with the people who you're showing alongside and understanding the curator's vision and why we were put together as a group. And I think for maybe for folks who are earlier in their career, it's a really good window into um, like why things get accepted and why things get rejected. And it's not always about quality. It's about um, what the work that was, you know, submitted is doing together. And sometimes that that selection of work sort of guides the, the juror's hand or the curator's hand a little bit. And sometimes the curator's in full control. You know, I think it just opened a lot of windows into, into a, a, a process that isn't always that open. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I I sort of that resonates with me is I just want to curate a show now like so bad. Uh, I've been in my studio for years just making and making and making and having the experience of being in the space with the artists, talking to them about their work, understanding why we were put together. It makes me want to 
do that on my own. It makes me want to reach out to people that I, I admire and that I think have interesting connections that maybe isn't obvious right on the surface and put them together in a space and see what happens. Um, so that's something that I, I wasn't anticipating, but it sort of put this little curator itch, you know, on my back and I, I got to figure out how to scratch it. <laughs> Get out there. You know, I highly recommend it. <laughs> it's a very sustaining practice, fun, humbling, awesome, awe-inspiring. Yeah. I mean, it's always such a privilege and like, yeah, to say glibly and say, oh, it was hard to choose a cohort, like just doesn't even do it justice. So thanks for raising that because it really, you know, I think there was a moment, as Robin knows well, where I was sweating um, in the finalist stage and, and really then, yeah, allowing your work, you know, the work of the, you know, the full cohort of eight to really start, you know, I was playing with printed out images, I was throwing it all into a Google Doc and moving it around and, and feeling not just associations or color, or even things I didn't realize till now, right? I was like, oh, I just realized there's these horizon lines and all of your work. You know, there's just so much that kind of unfolds from that in-person experience, whether it's you as a viewer viewing art in person, or the very rare chance we get to celebrate each other, to spend time together. I mean, five days in New York, I know y'all visited print shops and, you know, met other people. And um, yeah, I'll always remember our super fun headshot session, um, which just brought so much kind of, yeah, it's like, we should be celebrating ourselves. We're professionals. And some of these kind of ancillary things, like I love that Print Center built it in, right? That we're all getting cute new headshots. Um, and that I think is really, you know, really cute as somebody who had been rocking my like against a brick wall COVID era headshot for like a little bit too long. Um, and so, um, yeah, so again, saluting Print Center. And so with the last few minutes here, um, you know, reminding everybody the show's on view till August 25th, come out to see it. Um, but also wondering if each of you could take a moment to talk about, you know, what you're excited about right now in your life and your work. If you have an ambitious project you're, you're cooking up, you want to share that with us, we'd love to hear it. Aaron, you want to tell them about your boat? <laughs> I've been saying for months, I'm building a boat and nobody believed me, you know? And it's like, there's a boat. There's a boat on the planet now that didn't exist before. Uh, I have a, a solo show opening up at the Sioux Visual Arts Center, otherwise known as SUVAC in Minneapolis, Minnesota, August 5th. Um, uh, and recently I was uh, offered the entirety of the basketball court flooring uh, at the campus where I teach. And when someone offers you something like that, just say yes. Don't don't worry about how you're going to get it. Don't worry about how much space it's going to take up. Just go get it. And then if you got to get rid of it later, then that's fine. But say yes. Uh, I said yes. And this is one fiftieth of the material. <laughs> uh, so this is the boat. Um, the show and this boat are called Delicate and Filled with Dynamite. And it's made with the basketball court flooring and the remnants of an abandoned playground that it was on my property. Um, this is an in-progress photo. So if uh, if you wanna see it in its final state, you have to go to Minneapolis or wait until there's a picture of it on the internet somewhere. Uh, yeah, so that's what I got coming up and that is literally next week and I'm losing my mind. So, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Wow, <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Yeah, taking it way too into 3D. I don't know. I mean, is it seaworthy? No, it's uh, gorgeous. Amazing to see. I love the kind of sense to play, like the play, the sports, the sportsmanship, and then, yeah, this incredible structure. Wow. It's it's um it's sort of playful and terrifying all at the same time. When you see it in person, it's, it's 15 feet long. Wow. Um, and so it's really big and it's heavy and it you feel how heavy it, it looks. You know, you can you can like feel it. Um, and delicate and filled with dynamite is a quote from a book called In the Wake by Christina Sharp, where she describes uh, the sort of ripple effect of the transatlantic slave trade as the wake rippling out from the slave ship. And so she's talking about this wake through time. Uh, and so you, you heard me talk a little bit about that with the payday loan shark fin piece in the wake, uh, which is titled after that book. And this piece is sort of uh maybe on the other end of the extreme right like thinking about a vessel or a vehicle that could move us to a better place a better time uh away from sort of all this pain and trauma so yeah 
Amazing, thank you. Can't wait to see the final images. Lois, you have to share? Yeah, so I just uh, am finishing a grant uh, funded project that uses the type from those WPA posters. So when I had been working on this project last year, I was downloading uh, travel posters, cutting out all the letters. So it looked like in my studio, I was sending like really cool ransom letters or like uh, bomb threats, you know, very fun. Um, so I got a little bit of grant funding to digitize this uh, type. So you can download kind of a wonky version of it to use for posters or anything else you like. Um, so this, uh, it, these are two images from the exhibition that I had last week to check the box on the grant uh, form that you turn in. This is my first grant where you have to turn on that paperwork at the end. And I've really learned a lot also about how we need more unrestricted funding for artists that doesn't have reporting, <laughs> you know, anyway. So yeah, that's where I'm at. And now who knows what's next? Amazing, brava, nice work, good truth telling. <laughs> Julia, what are you cooking up? Oof. Um, so I don't have images of work that I'm cooking up yet because they're, they're, too, they're too tender and delicate to show people. <laughs> Um, so these are just some, these are actually not works in progress, but they're um, works that I recently finished, um, kind of taking it a little more into painting and thinking of using collage selectively. This is actually some really exciting, the figures are all made of this iridescent paper um, that you, it doesn't come across in the photos that I took, but um, you know, when you see them, they, they change a lot when you, when you move around. So that's kind of fun, but I'm really interested in, um, one of the pieces that's in the show, that's a black and white print. I think if you go, oh yeah, that's, that's also, um, the print is in the show, um, the one on the left and then the, the painting is on the right. That's a, a recent piece as well. Um, but Robin, if you could go back to like the black and white print called mother nature that has like the doors that open and close, um, on the slideshow. Uh, either way, I'm kind of interested in how I can scale that up. So yeah, so that piece on the left, how can I scale that up? This is like pretty small print. Um, I'm working on some prototypes for how to do this um, with wood and how to make doors that slide. Um, I'm interested in like, could I make this interactive for the viewer? Like, could there be, you know, like what things are, are, are hidden and what's concealed, what's revealed? Um, is there a door that a viewer could look inside and see you know, see some like surprising sculptural vignette? Is there somewhere that you could stick your hand in and touch something that has an interesting texture? Um, so yeah, so that that requires some skills that are beyond what I have. So if anybody has like a CNC router in the Los Angeles area, if you have wood skills, if you know how to build stuff, please give me a call because I need help. <laughs> but yeah, so planning all of that right now. Amazing. Come to my city, come to my studio. Okay, Let's we build talked some about stuff. this. We talked about this before we went on air and you said you would not pay Lois and I to come to your university. So <laughs> I'd apply to a grant. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. We'll apply to some grants. But I would brilliant, to. brilliant work. I mean, I, they were shaking their heads. I would stick my hand into a mother nature hole and find what's in there. I'm just saying. So bravo. <laughs> mother nature hole. I love that. <laughs> Thank <work>. you. <laughs> So much fun to be back, back with you all, saluting you and your incredible work. Much gratitude for everything you gave the show and you give the world with your work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you also, obviously, to Robin, my amazing comrade in curating this show and um, running this program. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, PCNY. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And um, thank you all for participating in such a great conversation tonight. Every time I hear the you guys talk about your work I learned something new and exciting and I could really just listen to you talk all night but I don't think we want to trap people on zoom for another hour and a half um so thank you Aaron Julia Lois and Carmen for joining us tonight in this conversation um if you are now itching to see their work and you're able to visit the gallery in person it will be on view um along with the other artist work that Carmen mentioned earlier, Farah Muhammad, Nina Jordan, Jacqueline Stryker, Erico Sogo, and who am I missing putting the pieces together? Who am I Juana. missing? And Juana Estrada Hernandez, thank you. 
eight's a, a long list of people to keep track of in my head. Um, you can plan a visit, explore the artists, learn more about our programs online at Print Center New York. Um, and if you are not able to come and visit in person, then uh, we would encourage you to take a look at that catalog um, with a wonderful essay about the show by Carmen, which you can also find on our website. Um, thanks everyone at home for joining us. Um, if this talk has gotten you interested in new voices and being in the program yourself, you'll get a fun pin. Um, we are now accepting applications for the 2024 cycle. Um, those are open now through September 8th. Uh, pardon me, I'm just trying to share some things and talk at the same time, very difficult. Um, excuse me. Um, so we'll be hosting a Zoom information session about the program and the application project process next week, Tuesday, August 1st, 6 p.m. Visit our website for more information about that. Follow us at Print Center New York on Instagram or subscribe to our newsletter for the most up-to-date information. Um, and if tonight's talk has you itching to make some prints, we invite you to join us the afternoon of Saturday, August 19th for a hands-on workshop exploring the material transformation inherent in printmaking led by New Voices artists Farah Muhammad and Nina Jordan. Registration for that event will also be opening next week on August 1st. If you'd like to hear more about the works in the show, including audio guides by the artists themselves talking more about their work, uh, you can download the Bloomberg Connects app to listen to those guides, and you can access that through that QR code on your screen right now. Uh, and finally, if you could fill out the survey when you exit the program, it'll open automatically, and we really appreciate hearing from you. Uh, thank you all so much, and from all of us at Print Center New York, have a great night. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care.